So I am a BMW E30 guy. I've ended up in this mess because of stinky old Subarus and then my shed burnt down. I'm in a Pontiac's by accident. I couldn't afford a 59 Buick Invicta coupe or a 61 bubble top Impala. I, a mate of mine had a car that was sitting at my parents' house. It was a 62 Bonneville four-door hardtop and they're a pretty unique looking car. All the parts were there, it was just disassembled and it was cheap. It was a third of the price of a comparable Aussie car. So we did a deal, I got it flat towed to my house and I started building it basically. I pulled the chassis out, discovered along the way the whole Pontiac backstory with racing and legendary hot rodders like Smokey Eunuch and, and Mickey Thompson and all the things that they did with Pontiacs back in the day at Daytona and the Bonneville Salt Flats and stuff like that. Bonnevilles are the top of the line for Pontiac. They're the full-size model and they had like your power windows, air conditioning, power steer, all that sort of stuff. Um, what I think is really cool about them is that Pontiac was GM's performance brand. So you had Cadillac and Oldsmobile and Buick and Chevy and, and those other brands, but Pontiac gave hot rodders like Mickey Thompson these engines and he was allowed to put him in a streamliner and go 400 miles an hour in 1960 across the Bonneville Salt Flats in a car he built at home. And then they won Daytona and the US Nationals and they won super stock racing and all this kind of stuff with cars that were like specially built that had aluminium panels and these huge engines and, and all that kind of cool groovy stuff that you could just never get away with today. So the car behind me is a 1964 Bonneville Sport Coupe that I should have never owned. It replaced my 62 Pontiac that I had basically gotten three quarters of the way through the restoration of and then my fridge motor burnt out in my shed and burnt the entire shed down, toasted the car, lost all my tools, lost a lot of memorabilia that I had from E30s and working in car mags for 20 years and that sort of stuff. That was a real bummer. And then this car popped up in Huntington Beach and it was owned by a guy who's quite well known in the scene called Kobe Gewurz. He runs Church Ezine and this was a spare car. He'd driven it around while he was finishing off a really famous car of his called Van Gogh and um, then he parked it up and so it had been parked for five years out the back of a shed. It came up at the right price. I had unfinished business with Pontiacs so I just jumped on it and imported it in February of 2015. I'm incredibly fortunate that I have a lot of really really good mates around me. The shed fire had come kind of at the end of a really, really horrible year. A mate of mine had been murdered and I'd lost jobs and, and my life felt like it was spinning out of control. But I always came home and worked on the Pontiac. There was always a project in the garage and then all of a sudden one day I looked out the back, literally just happened to be wondering why the dog was barking and the shed's completely on fire, the flames are out the windows and it is just this moment of sheer panic. If ever anyone watching this video, if your car catches fire and you know you can't put it out, walk away and don't look at it because the worst thing you can do is watch your car burn. It took me a long time to deal with that, but I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. So I'd lost everything and I'm incredibly lucky that um, Benny Mechanical Stig, he organized a tool drive and literally got me back on my feet in the, in the days after the fire and um, started that kind of process of coming back. After I lost the 62 and I found this car, I brought it in. I was basically almost 10 years younger, living a very different life. And this car was meant to be what's known as a Bellflower Cruiser. And that's like the Los Boulevardos style of thing where it's a 15 inch Astro Supremes, a flaked roof as low as possible, basically stock drivetrain. And we would, I was just gonna basically build it like that. Um, I wasn't sure if I was gonna paint the whole car in one go but it wasn't gonna be what you see behind me. And then life changes. I stopped wanting to just roll around beaches on the central coast and I wanted to drive it in a state and I wanted to have fun with my friends. And so now we have the car behind me.
as I kind of got into the project and I realized that my life was changing, the car had to change to still be usable with it, I did things like the original motor was rebuilt. So it was a all iron 389 Pontiac, put a cam in it and 66 GTO heads. And then I wanted to put air conditioning on it. And one of my mates said, well, if you're gonna do air conditioning, you may as well also do the EFI and you may as well do the alloy heads and all this other sort of stuff. So then I went on a particular run in January of 2020 down to Queenscliff in Victoria. And we, a mate of mine was driving his 56 Chevy pickup and we just had problems the whole way down. And I thought, if I'm going to drive this car like long distance, I want an overdrive transmission. I want an engine I can get parts for and I want it to be comfortable with air conditioning and all that sort of jazz. And that is when the snowball really started rolling down the hill. After I did the Subaru in 2016 with the boys, I actually went back to SEMA in 2017. And while I was over there, I bought an extra suitcase and brought a spare pair of alloy heads and intake manifold home in my luggage. And then we set up the Haltech 950 and that was phase two of the Pontiac powered build. So I brought the car into Australia in February of 2015, pretty much it had been sitting, so I changed all the fluids and I got a permit to sort of drive it around a bit and see what's what. And I drove it probably about 50 miles and then got it registered and was preparing to take it to Queensland to a mate's wedding. Drove it up the hill to my parents' house because they have a garage big enough to fit it and the transmission blew up. And that was the last time I drove it. That was the 29th of June, 2015. The car, when I got it, was a mystery blue with a metal flake roof. Originally it was aquamarine green, but uh, I decided that I wanted to do it green because Pontiac never sold a green full-size car in 64. And then if we're going to paint it, I wanted to spice up some of the body lines and bring in some of those custom touches like shave the trim and, and those sorts of things, but still look at, leave it looking like a classic car. So once... I decided on a green. I thought the best green that there is, in my opinion, uh, is the Commodore Holden Poison Ivy Green. So it's a nice emerald metallic. I never seen it in the sun until um, the day before it went to the dyno. And, that, and I'm really happy with my choice now. I know the car was aquamarine when it was originally built because I actually have all the paperwork for it. And this is one of the coolest things that um, it's one of the coolest things about this car for me is that I've got its original California license plates and I have the original quote that the first owner, Henry GM Bruno, got when he ordered the car. So it's like all the, all the data plates and, and that sort of jazz. And it, it, this, is a full, um, this is the full ownership history, including, um, including the price. So this car was nearly $5,000 back in 1964. So yeah, it's this, this sort of history, I really dig it because I'm a bit of a nerd. If you look at the license plate frames on the car, they say DiGiulio Pontiac. And that's actually where this car was sold new in, in Fresno. This is the actual purchase order for the car, brand new off the lot. So the, um, the power brakes were $43, power steering was $107. Uh, push button radio was $88.77. Custom seat belts retractable was $7.53. So all up, she was nearly five grand. And then Henry must have run a pretty good um, civil engineering company because he got a $600 fleet discount, which is a lot on a $4,000 car. One of the reasons why this car took so long to finish was because I built it completely out of phase. I ended up digging into the bodywork. We discovered that the body filler ran from the back of the front doors all the way to the tail lights, and that would, it was deeper than my hand. So there was quite a bit of paint stripping to do, and the whole car was completely bare metaled. I started the paint process with one bloke who shall remain nameless, but basically took a lot of my money and did absolutely nothing except set me back. And then I found Brad Power down at Coolers Hot Rods who helped fix a couple of bits of bodywork that I'm not skilled enough to fix. It's compound curves and things like that. And then he actually laid the color on because he thankfully had a booth big enough to actually fit the car. Because that was the other problem. A lot of smash shops couldn't fit the car in. That was when we uh, kind of decided to look at the powertrain again and things got a bit silly. Benny went to Drag Week in 2018. And before that, he'd sort of asked me what sort of engines he should be looking at bringing back in. 
So I said basically iron six liter LQ motors, really, really hot, sloppy mechanics. They make a lot of power with them. Picked one up for the boys. The engine came out of a river. A couple of months later, an email popped in from Seth at Texas Speed, maybe collaborating on an engine build. And the initial thought was Mod Max, because it's probably the best known LS swapped car that the boys had done. Like the HQ was uh, another 5.7 LS1 and played around with some other LS things on the show before. But Mod Max is the tire shredding fun car that just dominates skid pans and, and goes to events and blows everyone's minds. We pretty quickly worked out that the issue with putting a six liter, built six liter in Mod Max was that the manual transmissions just wouldn't keep up. The way that Mod Max gets driven, everyone sort of threw their hands up and said, has to be an auto, has to be built auto. We'd be, I'd been working with um, Heath and the guys at Harrop for quite a while. Initially, if we'd had time, we would have actually supercharged the HQ uh, for that super cheap ad but we ran out of time. That kind of project never kind of eventuated. So when I rang them up and said, hey guys, forget the stock bottom end 5.7, we're gonna do a built six liter. They got pretty excited too, but it just kind of led to a bit of a, an escalation, if you will, where a dirty great supercharger will put a dirty great amount of stress on the drivetrain. Pretty quickly we worked out that the best car for it happened to be a large, green 1964 Bonneville that happened to be sitting in my parents' garage. And that kicked the snowball even harder down the hill. The engine that Benny brought back from Drag Week was pretty interesting. I stripped it myself down at his shop and we discovered things like there was probably three inches of mud under the intake manifold. It had definitely been in a river. Uh, we sorted out the combo with Texas Speed and in my mind, there was only one guy to build an LS, and that's Troy Worsley from Warspeed Industries. May of 2020, we would had the block machined at Jenkins, and then we hit the build itself. So this is now, it's a Texas Speed crank. Uh, it's their Conrods as well, and a Wiseco piston. Around about 10.6 to one compression ratio, 403 cubic inches, which is 6.6 .6 liters in the new money. For Pontiac fans, they'll obviously recognize 6.6 .6 liters because that is a very famous Pontiac capacity as well. Uh, it runs Texas Speed LS3 CNC ported cylinder heads. There is a custom cam in the engine. It's not super choppy. It won't win any internet awards for its, uh, for its chop, but what it does is fill the cylinders really nicely. We've got Johnson short travel lifters, Manton push rods, water to air intercooled Harrop 2650 supercharger plonked on top of it, which has a sizable party pulley on the bottom. Marv's top tip, um, carry a dinner plate on the front of your motor so that if you ever break down and you need a little snacky poos, you can just whip this little sucker off and have yourselves a mad feed by the side of the road. Chicken chow mein, Singapore noodles, maybe a kebab if you'd like to eat your kebab with a knife and fork. Who knows? I'm not one to judge. But carry a dinner plate in front of you, mate, you mad dog. The original goal for this engine was to make a thousand horsepower at the crank. From that, we've got a, a Hughes Performance 4L80E, which is an electronically controlled four-speed auto. The car originally had an uh, automatic transmission called a Super Hydromatic, which is actually a fluid-controlled four-speed auto from the 60s. And I thought it would be really cool to put a modern four-speed auto in it. Uh, down the back, we've got a Geelong Diff's built nine inch diff, because I can get parts for them easily here. The original diffs, the Pontiac 9.3s are really, really good and strong and they were used in top fuel cars in the 60s. But there is one company that makes parts for them, Fabcraft Engineering. They're very expensive and you, you have to wait for the parts to come in from America if you ever need to fix it. So we did a strange engineering nodular iron center. We've got an Eaton True Track limited slip diff. We've got billet 35 spline axles, We've got Willwood disc brakes on the rear. I reached out to Hopper Stoppers in Victoria about the front disc brakes. Everything else for the car has had to come in from America in terms of the suspension and the drivetrain and, and that sort of stuff. So I figured that nobody in Australia would do a disc brake kit for a full-size Pontiac. And lo and behold, Eric from Hopper Stoppers said, oh yeah, we do a kit for them. So the car now has AU Falcon two-pot calipers. 
I changed the stud pattern to what is colloquially known as Chev or Holden stud pattern. And then that meant I had to get wheels. So Mark at Barrel Brothers built me a set of very different sort of wheels. Uh, these are GT engineering centers that look like a, an old racing three-piece three, three piece wheel from Australia called a Moa. And they're a 17 by eight and 17 by nine wheel guys don't ask me about the offsets, I can't remember. I'm really interested in 70s touring car racing and 80s touring car racing, so that's my little nod to touring car racing. And the rest of it is all basically designed to handle a thousand horsepower, drive a thousand Ks on the nose, easy as pie, and then uh, be easily serviceable. So it, it took a little while to get into Troy uh, because he's a one man band and he's got engines queued up out the door. What ended up happening was I sorted the engine machining. It had to be hot tanked a few times because it was so grubby. And then in May of 2020, we actually came in and assembled the entire bottom end in one day. That was really cool to see because I've been around LS engines for a long, long time with my work with magazines. There's a lot of little tips and tricks involved. Uh, we, we don't run billet main caps or anything crazy like that, but we're running all ARP hardware through the bottom end. Troy took a lot of time to carefully measure everything because the stress that this engine will be under with 19 pounds of supercharger boost being rammed down its throat means that uh, everything really does need to be checked. There's a lot of internet stories out there about these engines basically can be ripped out of the junkyard for $300, stuff a cam in them and a bus turbo on the side of them and they'll make 1500 horsepower. They will do that for three times and then they're gonna custom relocate their rods to the oil pan. Troy spent a lot of time preparing everything to go in the bottom end, so everything was pre-measured and then dry assembled. And then we kinda of came through and it was really surprising at how quickly he can knock an engine together because he has so many, there's so many little specialist tools that he used to actually get everything put together nice and secure and it all just went together butter smooth and he turned the engine over by hand. I, I remember building a Subaru engine the first time I did that and I got three quarters of a turnaround and it went clunk and didn't turn any further and I had to undo all my work. That doesn't happen with guys like Troy, um, trust the professionals. The cylinder heads, there was a lot in the valve train, measuring the push rod length to make sure that it wasn't holding valves open and things like that. So the car actually has a set of custom push rods. We got the top end of the engine assembled on the whole second day that we were there, except for the push rods. And we had to order them from America, bring them in, and I now know that my engine takes a custom length push rod. There's a lot to learn with ensuring that uh, LS engines are particularly frail in the uh, roller rocker department. They, the standard they run a needle bearing in the, in the roller rocker and they can fall out and that trashes your motor. So we've got a, a Trunnion upgraded uh, rocker setup in that engine to hopefully prevent that. And then there's a lot of other things. Troy knows exactly what kind of sump he likes putting. He never uses a standard sump on any of his engine builds. Uh, it, it comes down to oil control. These are a production motor at the end of the day. So the car, this engine doesn't run oil squirters it doesn't have a standard sump. It runs a dual row timing chain, which requires machining of the crank snout so that the timing chain sits properly on the crank. And these are all little bits and pieces that I was also learning on the fly uh, as we put the engine together, which is really rad. Once the engine was actually all together, it then came time to fit the engine. And what a lot of people might not realize is that Pontiacs are completely different to Chevys. So while there are a million different bolt-in kits for Chevys, I was kind of starting off a base of zero because there's probably only a handful of 64 Bonnevilles in Australia. Nobody I know has done an LS swap into one. Thankfully at the time, Marty and Moog had just started on their super garage journey. And so while there was a hoist in this big empty shed, I was able to bring the barge down and we basically dogpiled with a bunch of my really good mates and we got the engine in and out, in and out. We were cutting and clearancing and hammering and, and we made engine we made all the engine mounts using um, tough mounts who we've used on other MCM projects in the past. So we used a universal engine mount kit and then we used some pacemaker extractors which are the same type of header that we used on the HQ LS1 swap. But because this is a left-hand drive car with a steering box, 
there was a 11% worth of hammering that had to be done to fit them. And they're still really close. I would like to eventually change them so they're not quite as close to everything, but the car runs and drives. So I'm not that interested in pulling it off the road again. So old cars are really cool, but there is a very good reason why they don't make them like they used to. Uh, this car needed all new wiring from tip to tail. And that is where Dave from Haltech came on board and saved my bacon. Davo had a look at the car and all the stuff that electronically needed to be run. And he said that thou shalt Nexus R5 and PD16. Obviously that way the Haltec can run the electronically shifted transmission. It can run all the power to the air suspension. I've got electric air conditioning in this car. I've got a hydro, a hydraulic electric power steering system in the car and making sure all of that is reliable and just works all the time, every time was a key thing for me because I hate mucking around with wiring. Something that people should know if you've never done a big project like this before, this is essentially a ground up build. Getting the engine in the car and the box positioned in the car and having the headers on, you are only about 50% of the way there. And it took Davo and I weeks and weeks to get this car done. I was here most days until 11, sometimes 3 a.m. getting things done. Because there's so much stuff in the car, we had to write down the draw for the, the, the electronic load for all these things. We've got three fuel pumps, big thermo fans to keep the engine cool. We've got a, a water to air inner cooler system that needs to run. All this sort of stuff needs to be figured out. And so Dave then went through and wired every single one of these. There's every single uh, connector that has to be terminated. And then you have to fit all this electronics somewhere in an old car. And while it looks gigantic, this car is a reverse TARDIS. There's no space anywhere. That was a huge challenge and it, re it really tested me. But thankfully, uh, Davo obviously knows all the Haltech products really well. And things like the CAN keypad and the IC7 dash shortcutted us having to muck around with wiper motor controls and original ignition switches and all these things that are infamous for stuffing out on old cars. So we got the car wired and it came time, we hit the go button. Am I actually allowed to say kicker in the guts barrel? All right, here we go. And that was rad and I think on the third start, the car actually, there was some insulation that was exposed and it actually caught fire. It was uh, wrapped around some, uh, some fiberglass matting caught fire that was wrapped around the ignition leads. And that set us back a little bit. So I actually took it to a mate of mine's house who lives right down near the Haltech Dino. And we got basically the rest of the car buttoned up to a point where it was safe to go on the dyno. We got the thing shifting gears. Um, we sort of buttoned up a couple of leaks in the fuel system and then it was time to strap it down and put a running tune in it, basically. I think the dyno day was probably the most nervous I've been because this car has been a part over so many years. You get, you go work on the car and then you get busy and you go away and then you come back several months later or after COVID lockdowns and all this sort of stuff and you forget where you're up to. And so you miss things. And I missed a, a few little silly things on this car that just set me back. So I was really nervous that this thing was gonna, um, that was gonna throw something silly. Like I had complete faith in the engine because I know Troy builds a great engine. When it spun up the first power run of 555 horsepower, I was just, it's such an emotional point. It sounds so awesome. I was hoping for something that would get me up hills at the speed limit. Well, we well and truly got that. So I think what we've got going, we, we do have a few things going on. We've got a belt slip issue. Yep. I'd built up in my head that the first drive was going to be magic and I'm going to be listening to my favourite song and, and the sun's going to be shining and the birds are chirping and people are giving out free paddle pops and it's all sick. And actually what happens is I was white knuckled 
terrified, listening for everything that was going wrong or watching for stuff that the fluids are going to be shooting out of, you know, the radiator or something like that. The first drive that I actually enjoyed was a few days after the dyno. I am really, really, really keen to put the right size supercharger belt on it. The belt slip is the biggest problem we've got where we simply can't make any more power because we can't spin that charger above about four and a half grand. I'll put my hand up. The reason why it's, the belt is slipping on the dyno is because I forgot that we just had a belt on it for, the, for a photo shoot. That was, that's it. It's a silly mistake. One of those things you forget and I will atone for that shortly. The plan was from the outset to build a four digit capable power plant. Ideally 1,000 horsepower. Because it's been such a big build though, that doesn't, getting to that figure doesn't happen overnight. We discovered, so it made 587 at the rear wheels, but as soon as it hit 5,000 RPM, the supercharger belt that I'd put on it was too long, just, just too long, and it meant that the 19 pounds of glorious boost that we had bled down to nine pounds, and so it wasn't turning the supercharger as efficiently as it should have been. Also, a factor that we've got the fuel system in place thank you to Jamie at Raceworks, to make that 1,000 horsepower. We have the ignition system in place to do it, we have the ECU in place to do it, but there's no need on the first dyno run to shoot for the moon. The other thing is, I also need to learn to drive this car, and that's something that not a lot of people talk about, because it is spicy when you stab it. After the dyno, basically I took the car home and I went through the undercarriage and nut and bolted the car because that is something you should do. If you're doing a project, nut and bolt it, please. Stuff falls off. The first sort of sunny Saturday we had, taking that car out, I wasn't really processing it until I was driving down my local street and I saw the guy that runs the, the bottle shop in my street and he just had this huge smile on his face and it was just this realization that this is it. This is actually what I've been wanting to do for seven years now. And um, it was really, really, really special. Taking it for its first drive, making sure it wasn't gonna catch on fire again, and then coming home and taking my wife for a drive in the car because she had never actually been in the car. And so it was really special to take her out and say, this is, this is why I've had all the skin knuckles and lack of sleep and this is where all the money's gone. And she gets it, she loves it. So that's, it's hard to put into words how happy I am over that. I am so emotionally invested in this car that it's not my favorite American car. People ask all the time, you know, well, after all this time, are you gonna sell it? Like you could make a lot of money back on it and it won't ever pay the bills that I've spent on it. But it's also that this car actually represents something where I'd come through a, a quite a tough year and I've bounced back and I've won. And it's also a bit of valediction for me because I've spent 20 years writing for Street Machine Magazine, calling people up and saying, tell me all about your car build. And now I have, I, ac I can actually say and I can empathize with them. You know, I know the setbacks that they go through when they build these sorts of cars. I understand the heartbreak and, and the, also the joys. That moment where you do pull it out onto the street and you give it a womp and the thing goes blah and it's just happiness. This car will not be leaving my caretakership. And it also like Pontiac people hate LS swaps. So I guess I'm never able to sell it then. Something that I realized as the project got pretty close was that I see a lot of people talking online about whatever channel they're watching should build cars that real people can own. I am a regular person. I had to, to build this car, I had to work a few jobs, but that is the sacrifice that I, I wanted to make to get to this point. I am not a trained mechanic. You can go out and learn the skills, you can learn to weld, and I made the entire exhaust myself here. It's not, it's not the prettiest exhaust. There's no, there's no um, weld corn under there, but it is something I made for my car. And I think that what some people miss is that the journey's sometimes as important as the finished result and the personal growth that you can get out of it. Um, that's just, it's, it's incredible. And the satisfaction you feel when you build your car, it doesn't, don't worry about, you know, 
people doing SEMA builds or doing you know, top 60 elite haul builds. Build the car you want in the way you want and get the satisfaction from achieving something yourself. Mm -hmm.